This Juno World Affairs Council presentation is a co-production with 360 North, recorded April 23, 2014 at 360 in Juno. Ambassador Richard Boucher, whose lengthy career in the Foreign Service included serving as Assistant Secretary of State for South and Central Asian Affairs, discusses emerging markets. Okay, good evening everybody. It's good. I guess we'll wait till the music stops. All right, let's try again. Good evening, everybody. It's great to see everybody here. I want to thank uh, I want to thank Joy Ann Bloom for welcoming me here, and the other members of the Juno World Affairs Council for having me. And uh, it's really exciting to come back to Juno after 30 years. Um, I know it's more than time to come back, but maybe next time I'll come back even sooner. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is, is to talk a little bit about the world economy and our place in it and what's going on in the world economy and especially with regard to the emerging markets. And after that, we, we can talk about anything you want to. I'm glad to take questions for a while. Um, but what I'd like to do is start out with a little video clip, which I think they can show. Who are those guys? Who are those guys? Who are those guys? Jesus, who are those guys? You say they're hired permanent? No, just till they kill you. Yeah! All right, so I think uh, some, most of you, rec well, many of you rec remember Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. I think a lot of us in the world today, we feel like we're being relentlessly pursued by a bunch of railroad uh, hired cops. Uh, hopefully, we're not going to end up jumping off the cliff into the water. Um, but that same sort of feeling of relentless pursuit by these growing, emerging market economies, the China, the India, the Brazils, these big guys that are coming right behind <laughs> us, uh, we have that feeling. And so we've got to figure out who are those guys. And what are we going to do about them? And that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, and let me start out by saying I'm sure this is the way the British and French felt about 100 years ago, maybe a little more, with those Americans from way across the ocean relentlessly pursuing them, growing, building railroads, making steel, and developing new products. Um, so this is a normal phenomenon. This is the way the world economy has worked for quite a long time. And the economists call it convergence, or they call it catch-up. That's with a C, not a K. Um, and it means that countries can adopt technologies. They can move more quickly at certain stages of growth. And the closer they get to the leading edge, to the frontier, the harder it is to stay in the front. Now, not every country that starts out on this path makes it. It's not inevitable. Many countries have started to grow very, very quickly and failed, some in Asia. Just remember, think about 100 years ago, Argentina was one of the most developed economies in the world. Uh, they didn't make it for a whole lot of reasons. Um, but the other thing is each of these countries has their own problems. Uh, they've got problems to face. They've got difficulties that are internal. Uh, and we have to understand that. So they've got to take care of their problems. We're going to have to take care of some of our issues. So I, what I wanted to do was look at what's going on, then talk about four of the countries, more particularly China, India, Brazil, and Indonesia, uh, and then come back to the United States. Catch up or convergence is based on the fact that people can adopt the latest technology once it's been developed. It's harder to develop a technology than it is to use whatever's on the shelf. So for example, when I was in Shanghai in the mid-1980s, you could barely make a telephone call across town. Uh, and the people who answered were rude anyway, so you didn't really want to. But at a certain point, you could suddenly pick up the phone and make a crystal clear phone call to the United States because they put in a brand new international switchboard, and we could call the switchboard directly, and then that would connect us through satellites back to the US. And people are doing that again and again, not just those people all over the world now who have the latest smartphone and cell phone technology but people in factories, um, people that are using machinery and equipment to make products, 
Uh, so a lot of the catch-up and convergence is based on the fact that people can adopt technologies that we've already developed, and they don't have to go through the whole learning period, the whole development period, and they don't have all that built-in infrastructure, the legacy costs of converting to the newest and the most modern technologies. But the other thing going on in the world is things are made in value chains. This has always been true. Products had different stages of the production process, and you know, cars made in the United States would go over to Canada and come back a couple times during the process. But the process is now being divided up more and more and more and more. And you have, uh, in, the, in the production process, well, it's, these are the converging countries. I should have clicked the button a little quicker. But look at how, many, how much of the, the, the world is in catch-up mode, those, those green guys. Anyway, somewhere in here I thought I had another slide, but I guess I don't. Uh, in the convergence process, in the value chains of how things are made, uh, the countries that make the most money out of a product are the ones that develop it, that do the development, the marketing. And actually, the value of manufacturing is less and less as time has gone on. So for example, uh, China makes about 10 bucks off an iPhone. The real money goes to the United States, where it's developed and designed and where it's marketed. Uh, a lot of the money goes to Japan and Korea for the chips that go inside, so some places for the glass that's on the screen, other places for the hard drive that might be inside. Um, products like this are made all over the world and they're made in value chains that connect the world. Um, and this phenomenon is actually gonna strengthen as we go forward when you think about how products are made. The manufacturing part is getting cheaper and cheaper. And as we develop more and more sophisticated robotics in the manufacturing products, process as we develop more 3D printing, for example, that piece of assembly and manufacturing that's down at the bottom of the value chain is actually really going to become less and less. And so some of these countries that are trying to rely on low-cost manufacturing for their growth are going to have problems because some of these things, as we're already seeing, some of these things can be done just as well or cheaper in the United States. Does that mean we're going to recover manufacturing jobs? No. It means we're going to get the new manufacturing jobs, the ones that are based on sophisticated automation and robotics, not necessarily the old manufacturing jobs. For us to stay on the, on the leading edge, for us to stay on the frontier of product development where the money is, uh, we've got to keep developing new products. Now, we're pretty well positioned to do that. Out of the world's 100 top brands, 55 of them are American. So we actually have a pretty good stake in the future development of products. But again, even for us, it's not inevitable. So I want to talk about the countries that are starting to catch up to us. Let's start with China. That's the big one that everybody worries, worries about. And this is only one chart about China, but it's a simple chart. And what this chart shows is the red line, uh, the amount, the percentage of investment in their economy is going up and up and up. And now China is investing something like 50% of their uh, economic wealth, of their economic strength every year. That's an enormous amount. That's more than almost anybody. Uh, every now and then, if you look back at the history of Japan or Malaysia or some of these countries, they've, they've bumped into that level, but never in a way like China. China is investing more and more. And the blue line in the bottom is their growth rate. And it's going down. It's not going down real fast. But what it tells you is they're putting more money in and they're getting less growth out. Now what's that a sign of? That's a sign of the end of a model. What they've been doing is not going to keep working. They can't keep putting more money in forever and getting less out of it year after year after year. And indeed, the Chinese uh, leadership realizes they've got to rebalance. They've got to adjust their model. They've got to go from investment-led growth to consumer-led growth. Uh, they've got to go. Uh, away from export markets to domestic markets. They've got to develop an internal engine to pull growth along, and they've got to satisfy Chinese consumers. And so right now, we're seeing every quarter the Chinese growth rate tick down a little bit. And they realize this is becoming more and more urgent to rebalance the economy. Rebalancing the economy in economic terms is pretty easy to say. It's much harder to do because economics is always ends up being politics. It means taking power away. It means taking power away from the people who've been leading growth, who've been benefiting 
from all that investment. That means the big state enterprises, the government corporations that have been leading the charge and who wield enormous political power. It means taking power away from the export industries, the, uh, the, the ones who've been in these value chains making manufacturing products who have a lot of local and other governmental support. And it means taking power away from uh, the, the coastal provinces who've been the biggest beneficiaries of the investment and the opportunities of foreign markets. So as you think about China adjusting its economy, you've got to think about watching the political system change as well. And sometimes the, the fights that are going on within the Chinese leadership reflect the politics of the adjustment as much as they do uh, ordinary politics. Now, what the Chinese leaders have started to do is to insert a bit more market discipline on these folks that are going to have to adjust. And so last year in November, the big party meeting announced that they were going to let interest rates float. I mean, state corporations, big enterprise are going to have to pay higher interest rates for the money that they've been using and wasting on investments that don't pay off quite so well. Uh, they've announced that they're going to insert more competition, more market mechanisms into the economy so that these companies are going to have to compete a little more. Uh, and they've announced they're going to try to open up the markets a little bit so other people can set up companies and compete with them and serve the domestic consumers. Uh, they've announced that they're going to try to adjust the corporate governance so that the companies have to behave themselves differently in the economy and be more accountable to their, states, to their shareholders. So these things are bits of trying to assert market discipline on the big corporations that have benefited from this investment company. But it's, it's not going to be easy. Um, there's going to be a bumpy ride along the way. They've got the money probably to make the adjustment, but they've also got a credit bubble and a housing bubble at the same time. So they're going to have to, they're going to, have to do bailouts and buyouts, and it's going to be a kind of a messy adjustment. How much is Chinese growth going to go down? I can't say for sure, frankly. I'm not sure I trust the numbers entirely anyway. Uh, but it, China's economy has been growing at 10 percent. And then it was growing at 8 percent. Now it's growing at 7 something percent. And it'll certainly go below that. But how low can they go? I don't really know. So now let's talk a little bit about India. The question being asked in India is can they, get, can they muster a new round of reform? This is what the World Bank calls their doing business indicators. They do this on every country in the world. There's about 183 countries. And if you look sort of in the middle of the chart, you see where does India rank on most of these indicators of doing business? How easy is this to start a company? How easy it is to enforce a contract? Well, <laughs> India is way in the bottom corner of all these indicators. It's very hard to get into a market, start a new company, and do business in India, particularly if you want to get in in a big way. Now, a lot of this, a lot of the growth we've seen in India in the last 20 years comes out of a big round of reforms that they launched in 1991. Um, and it was a, it was a real effort. Uh, Manaman Singh, the guy that's prime minister now, but not for much longer, he was finance minister of time and he's, at the time, and he's generally associated with these reforms. And it was a minority government. So what's going on right now in India is that they've got an election going on. 800 some million people are in the middle of voting. It'll be done at the end of this month and the results announced in May. The guy who's expected to win, uh, Nahendra Modi, uh, is believed to be pro-business, uh, but he's also probably going to end up in a minority government. So the question you've got to ask for India is can they muster a new round of reforms? Can they muster a new round of getting rid of a lot of the things that stand in the way of doing business and raise their scores here as well as make their economy grow again. Let's look for a minute in, at Brazil. Here's one chart on Brazil, and it shows, in some ways, it starts to show the opposite of what's going on in China. What happened to Brazil over the last few years is they started exporting more and more raw materials and natural resources, um, especially mining and oil, uh, but primarily mining products. And so that red line, the exports of primary goods, natural resources, was going up. And the blue line, their sales of manufactured goods has been going down. They haven't been investing in the domestic manufacturing market. So they've got an economy that's been pulled along by consumption 
a, a internal engine for growth. Uh, and they've got an economy that's been pulled along uh, by exports of natural, of commodities. So unfortunately, commodities bounce up and down depending on the markets. And during the, during the economic downturn in the United States and Europe, Brazil did pretty well selling to China. But now that China's going down, they haven't found other markets. Now, some commodity exporters do very well. The state of Alaska has done very well on exporting natural resources and commodities. Canada pulls it off very well. Australia pulls it off very well. Uh, but Brazil needs a lot more balance, and they haven't really found it yet. So they need to raise their investment, raise their production of manufactured goods, especially for the domestic market, and get a stable macroeconomic situation that's not subject to all these fluctuations based on foreign demand. I want to take a quick look at Indonesia. And Indonesia is a story that you're starting to hear more and more around the world. Uh, many years ago, when I studied what little economics I know, uh, we used to talk about the problem that population poses for countries that are trying to develop. Uh, if you could grow your economy at 5%, but your population is growing at 2%, you're really only making people's lives 3% better. That was seen as a drag. Population, especially young population, was seen as a drag on growth. Well. These days, people talk about population as a very strong asset in two ways. One is what the Indonesians call their demographic dividend. They've got a very young population. 44% of the people in Indonesia are under the age of 25. So this is a, a new workforce. This, these are people who can go to work, make new products, who can create new markets, um, and who can really contribute to the economy. And as they develop, as they become middle class, and you see the light blue line shows how much they've increased the size of their middle class. They're sort of like Brazil. They develop this internal engine for growth, and so they have the ability to keep growing. But the question is, can they educate their young people, their kids, so that they can really contribute to the economy, so that they can start companies, so that they can work in more and more sophisticated products and markets, do the design, and make money? And that's really the question for them. This middle class phenomenon is all over the world. And the middle class is a strong engine of growth. There are, I think, uh, $17 trillion economies now. Uh, and those engines are good for the, econ for the world economy. Uh, but you've got to be able to keep that young population and that middle class happy. Otherwise, you're going to have revolutions. And you're starting to see that in the Arab Spring, in the anti-corruption movement in India and other places. Well, these are not the only countries that are developing. Here's a list of last year, the top 10 uh, growth countries. Uh, some of them, like uh, Mongolia, Libya, are commodity exporters, uh, Mongolia mining especially. Uh, Macau's got uh, gambling. Um, so he, there are some with peculiar circumstances. But if you look at this, four of these countries are in Africa. There are a lot of countries now in Africa that are growing more and more quickly. Um, so one shouldn't give up on parts of the world. That This phenomenon of uh, faster growth, better growth, getting involved in the value chains, developing an internal market, and catching up to the most developed economies is getting wider and wider around the world. And hundreds and hundreds of millions of people are living better lives. And for me, that's a good thing. But if we're going to keep our position, then we've got to think a little bit about us. Um, so I want to talk about the United States. I just want to talk about sort of two or three things. The first is, is I said before, we've got to keep innovating to stay at the frontier, to stay at the technology edge, to keep developing the new products and organizing the production processes. And the key, the essential ingredient to all that is education. So where are we on the education scale? Well, this is a chart from the OECD. And what it says is, here's the United States. and Right there, you see a blob. And that blob is an arrow and a square. Okay, Now, the squares are the people from 55 to 64. That's my generation. The arrows are the people from 25 to 34. That's the new generation. And this is the percentage of each generation that goes to college, or that gets through college. Well, for the United States, the squares and the arrows are in the same place. In other words, We've done very good on educating our population. 
but we're still educating the same percentage at, at the college level as we did 20 or 30 years ago. And if you look at all the squares, we led the world. Our square was the highest square. But now if you look at the arrows, we're right in the middle of the arrows. And what happened was countries learned from us. They looked at us 20 or 30 years ago and said, how come the Americans do so well? And the answer was because we've got a great proportion of our population that go to college. And countries said, well, what do we have to do to do well? And they said, we've got to send more people to college. And so they developed the university systems. And so you get people like Koreans, who are the one way over on the left, their square was way down low, around 12% or, yeah, something like 12%. And they shot up. They're over 60% now, making it through college. And the younger you are in Korea, the more likely you are to go to college. It's astounding. They learned from our experience. And they started sending more and more of their kids to college. And that's happening in country after country after country, where they saw, what did the Americans do? And they're doing it. Only they're improving, and we're not. And that's, to me, that's the crucial thing we've got to do. We've got to get back uh, the growth in educating a new generation of kids better than my generation was educated. There are a lot of other things we should look at, but some of this, I think, comes down to the way we run our economy. Um, I'm not anti-regulation. Uh, I think a well-regulated economy is really important, and that some of the problems we had in the downturn were because of the poor quality of our financial regulation. So, but I think we're, we tend to go about it in a much too heavy-handed way these days. This is just a, uh, a chart that the line represents the number of bills passed by the Congress, and the light blue bars represent the number of pages involved in those bills. In other words, they're legislating on fewer and fewer topics, but they're adding more and more rules to each bill about how we should run those things. And I think there's a group of people now who are looking at smarter regulation. What is the minimum set of rules that you can have to properly regulate something? So you don't leave it all alone, but you try to figure out smarter ways of regulating. And let me, let me mention one, because it will be totally unpopular here and many other places. But instead of laying down rules about emissions and the use of fuels and things like that, why don't we just put a price on carbon? Why don't we charge for carbon? Let the market decide. Let people decide how to use carbon, how they want, whether they want to burn coal or some other fuel, whether they want to burn how much they want to drive their cars. Uh, but instead of doing that, we have a whole series of diverse regulations and all kinds of entries industries. And instead of having a flexible response based on market forces, we have a bureaucratic response. We have a, an opportunity for what's called regulatory capture, which means if you can get a little line that gives you an exception or a better deal in the regulations, then you can make more money. Um, so I think there are a lot of instances like that where a bit, being a bit smarter about how we regulate things might give us a more efficient and more productive economy. So. I mean, what I, what I generally say is uh, an economy is like a boat, you know? It grows barnacles. And every few years, every 10 or 20 years, you've got to pull it out of the water. You've got to scrape the barnacles off. And that's what I think we ought to be doing now. We should take advantage of the crash um, and look at how we do things and scrape the barnacles off our tax code, our regulatory system our government programs that duplicate each other. Uh, now, I wouldn't be doing my job as a foreign affairs specialist unless I said the domestic side of this is not the only side of things we need to do. We need to be able to project ourselves overseas in a new and different way. And especially we need a capability to project ourselves in countries and to help work out some of these deals, make the value chains flow better, maintain the U.S. position in the world. And part of that is the foreign affairs budget. And so the simple thing I want to say is 1% of the U.S. budget now goes to foreign affairs, just barely over 1%. And we've got to keep spending that. Maybe we could even spend 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3% more of our federal budget on having a capability overseas. A lot of the places that I served, 
people's first impression of the United States came at a very early age. I'd meet people in Cyprus who would say, I'd be sitting in my village, and I'd hear a truck come, park in the square, and I'd hear the sound of a generator start, and a projector would start. And we'd all go down, and we'd sit in the square, and on one of the white walls in the village, they would project these movies about American agriculture. And it would be like these huge combines going over these enormous fields of wheat, and harvesting wheat. That had nothing to do with us. We were up in the villages in Cyprus, sitting under our olive trees, you know, pressing olive oil and making wine. But it was great. It showed us there was a whole world out there. I talked to people in India who said, when I was in college, I used to go down to the American Library and I'd read the magazines. And I said, oh, were you interested in the United States? And they said, not really. But it was the only place a college student could go to get air conditioning. Well, so I started thinking, what's the equivalent now? Well, the equivalent is getting kids on the internet. The equivalent is showing them that there is a world out there and that they can be part of it and that we, the United States, can do something with it. And I've seen this in, in places in, in Turkmenistan in an uh, old concrete building where you open a door on the second floor and there's a huge, there's an American corner, an American library with computers and college catalogs and kids having a great time inside. I've seen it in Peace Corps everywhere, all over the world, where one-on-one, -on -one, somebody's going into villages and saying, hey, there's a world out there, and that's where I come from, and I can help you get into it. And helping those kids grow up and get into the world is something that our diplomacy can do by extending the platforms. Um, our diplomacy does it. Our businesses do it. Our NGOs do it. Our technology does it. Google and Facebook do it. But we've got to be out in the world. Uh, trying to get people to work with us, opening up the world to the, to the young generation and giving them a chance to participate in platforms that we can provide them. So when you think about budgets in Washington, and I know that's pretty far away, particularly as you're finishing a legislative session in Alaska, uh, think about the foreign affairs budget a little bit and see if we can maintain and even increase that 1% a little bit more. Anyway, that's... Uh, that's how I see what's going on in the world in the big picture. Um, I've been working on this stuff for a couple decades. So thank you very much for listening, and I'd be glad to talk about anything you guys want to. Appreciate it. Who wants to go to the microphone and start? Sir. Thank you for being here. I agree with you about the carbon tax. I've asked each of our U.S. senators in a personal and in a public forum, will you help us achieve a carbon tax? And each said individually, won't happen. End of conversation. End of conversation. Someone's calculated that uh, consumption in the world today requires about the output of 1.5 planet Earths. So we're already over-consuming. So how are we going to build an economy in China, for example, based on consumption? Well, I think the good news in China is that they've decided they have to be more energy efficient already. And the Chinese are actually fairly serious about, uh, uh, about using better technologies, about using better you know, uh, efficiency in their energy consumption. Um, I guess the clearest sign was about four or five years ago they said that every party cadre was going to be graded on how he did on the environment. Um, so if it's, you know, if it's part of your efficiency report at, at the office, you tend to try to do better. Um, but I've got some friends in NGOs, environmental NGOs, who say the Chinese are pretty serious. Um, they are going to develop, but the question is, can they do it cleaner than we did? And that's where catch-up counts, where they're not going to do it. They, they understand. They, they don't make the argument. They never really have, but they certainly don't make it anymore. You know, you guys polluted in order to develop, and now it's our turn. You don't hear that in China. They say, you know, what's the best technology we can have to do this? And so hopefully if we can help with the technologies, if we can help with the quality of the factories, they're willing to do it and they will develop more efficiently than we did. Hi. <clears throat> I understand that there's been some controversy about the rising percentage of foreign students 
who are in our universities and then leave and go back to their own countries. It sounds like that's something that uh, you come down on the side of being glad about. I'm, I'm happy they're here. Uh, one of the best things the United States does in the world, one of the best platforms that we provide to other people for their own development, is an education system. And the fact that foreigners come here to get educated is good for us. I've seen it work. I mean, I've seen it not work. A lot of the students that took over our embassy in Tehran had been educated in the United States, so it's not a magic you know, cure for everything. But by and large, you know, I'm meeting people overseas who are in very important positions, who went to the United States universities, who know the United States, care about the United States, have, and, and are sending their kids to their alma mater, usually paying the full fare. Um, a lot of students come and they spend a while, and then they get to a certain age and they go home. When I first went to Taiwan in the late 70s, most of the students who came to the United States stayed in the US. But a lot of them stayed for about 10 years. And they turned 30, which for some people is significant, but maybe I'll know someday. Um, and they, they started having kids. They started thinking about going home. They wanted to graze their kids near grandma. They wanted them to go to Chinese schools. And as soon as there started appearing jobs in Taiwan where they could work, electronics jobs usually, They'd go home, they'd accept less salary, they'd work in the, in the industry back there, and they'd, they'd be home, just probably the way we are. And I'm seeing the same thing happening now with Indians, people going back to India for many of the same reasons, starting companies in India. But the world is also different. It's not you're here or you're there. A lot of the students who are here, they're made doing business with the folks back home, with their, their you know, college classmates or their cousins. Uh, somebody who's here who starts a business is as likely to operate a business that transcends one particular place and that links, you know, California and India. Or, you know, I know French people come here to start businesses because it's so much easier to start a business in the United States than it is in France. But they don't leave everything behind the way we used to when we went to another country. They have the internet. They have technology transfers. And as products get more and more digital, it's going to be so much easier to transfer things back and forth. Um, so I think, you know, by and large, having them here is a great thing. Uh, they'll go home when it's time, but in the meantime, it's great to have them. It's great to be able to provide that ability to them. Um, sort of a two-part, um, oops, two-part question. Um, international affairs budget is different from international aid budget, they both seem that they have in common that there's some self-interest for the United States. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what's the relationship between the two? Do they support each other? Can some international aid be applied to international affairs? Um, just the relationship. Yeah, this, this budget, this international affairs budget is about 50 billion. It's 40, I think it was 50 last year, maybe 46 in the new budget request. Aid is a s smaller component of that. Aid is 30 or 35 billion. So aid is less than 1% of the US budget. And frankly, if you go out on the street and you ask most Americans, how much do we spend on foreign aid? You'll get numbers like 15, 20, 25% of our budget. But it's actually less than 1%. And the aid, you know, aid can be very important. Um, and I don't want to denigrate it. And it feeds the hungry. It takes care of the sick. It does some very important things around the world, and it, and it preserves the peace in a lot of places. But the hundreds of millions of people who can eat better, who can feed their kids, who can warm their houses, who can have a better life, most of them got there by private enterprise, by being able to participate in manufacturing, uh, by getting education. and so. We need to spend money on aid, and it's, it's part of that budget. Um, the export financing is part of this budget. The uh, cost of the State Department and all our embassies is part of that budget. So we need to keep that up and do a little more. But we also have to remember the U.S. impact on the world is not just diplomats like me or the aid budget. Uh, it's Americans who go out and teach. It's Americans who welcome foreigners to their country, to our country. It's American businesses that organize 
manufacturing opportunities or to do products across across uh, national borders. Yeah. What do you make of the state of divisive politics in the U.S. and how do other countries, you know, to make a big generalization, um, view that state of divisive politics where I'll just go out on a limb and say the conservatives are not supporting everything from higher minimum wage to health care to immigration reform, education broadly, um, and on and on and on, all of which would seem to detract from our advancement stability as a, as a nation. Anyway, do you have any remarks about that in general or how other countries look at us? I've been, uh, I've been apolitical all my life, and I've worked for Democrat administrations and Republican administrations, so I'm going to let the, the position on who's, who's at fault uh, remain with each of you to figure it out. But frankly, the paralysis in Washington, it's, it's embarrassing. Um, I used to be able to say to people, um, look, we have pretty nasty politics. We yell at each other. We throw food. We hit each other with sticks. But then we go in the back room, we cut the deal, and we fix our problems. Americans face up to their problems and fix them. And for decades, that was true. Um, frankly, the last couple of years, it's much harder to say that. And since the economic crisis in 2008, we've addressed very few of the fundamental and underlying causes. And one of the things I'm worried about now is we're going back to all the same mistakes. You know, we've got. Uh, you know, the way, the way the banking system operates, the lack of regulation, the way the rating agencies operate. There's a whole lot of things that we're just doing the same thing we did before the crisis. So maybe, uh, you know, how long is it going to take to get another one? And I want to be able to go out in the world again and say, we face up to our problems and we fix them. And one thing I saw in Japan in the 90s was their unwillingness to write off bad loans, their unwillingness to face up to their problems and fix them. And I'm afraid, I'm afraid we could fall into that. I hope it's not permanent. I don't think it is. I kind of look back at American politics and see we go through these periods sometimes. I mean, you want to read about nasty political uh, partisanship, you know, go back to the founding fathers and see what they said about each other. So it's not, uh, it's not the argument that matters. It's the fact that we can't cut the deal. Speaking a little bit in generalities, um, certainly in my lifetime, it wouldn't be hard to say that we've seen most countries thaw or move towards Western models of capitalism and improve, develop. But it seems to me, certainly in the time I've been alive, alive, and I think you could argue back even to the 20s, that the Middle East has remained unstable and tipsy. Comment why that seems to be the case and why it doesn't seem to find a foothold to develop like other parts of the world? I think it all depends how far back you want to go. I mean, the Middle East has been dominated by dictators and one-party states. Um, those are the kind of governments that at some point they look stable. And certainly we've supported some of them with a lot of money over the years. But in the end, it's ultimately not stable. I mean, you can say, you know, okay, Egypt was a, you know, a strong authoritarian regime with one-party state. Um, now, they were peaceful for 40 years. They had peace with Israel. No more wars started for 40 years. We invested a lot of money to make sure that happened. So on the one hand, you could say that's a success. But on the other hand, you have to say it's not going to go on forever. And so as you get you know, educated young people, as you get a rising middle class, as you get more and more people in Arab countries looking at their state of underdevelopment and saying, we don't just need a better economy, we need better government. And a lot of the work being done in economics these days has to relate to the fact that, that governance is one of the key elements in how an economy grows. And I think we all believe in our minds that quality governments produces quality growth. 
but we haven't quite figured out how to do that. So my view is that if these revolutions start with a fruit seller in Tunisia who was frustrated that he couldn't make money because of all the regulations, ultimately they're going to end up pushing aside a government that's not governing well. Um, maybe if we spent more time working on quality governance in an honest and, and, and decent way, we could get to a longer, a longer term stability. But in some ways, we can't do it. They've got to do it themselves. They've got to figure it out for themselves, and they've got to decide where they want to go. So as they try to get the, through that path, it, we'll probably see continued instability. Some countries are doing OK. Tunisia seems to be settling down and figuring out the governance issues. There's been a lot of reform in Jordan and, and Morocco, even with the kings there. Um, but they've got to keep going down that path, and others are going to have to figure out how to go too. But it's up to them in the end, not us. Sir? It seems fairly regular that in the news we're hearing about the wider gap, the income gap, the excessively wealthy and the, and the lower. And I read yesterday or day before that for the first time, perhaps in the U.S. history, that our middle class is no longer the largest middle class in the world. Canada surpasses us. I think there are three other countries. Uh, could you briefly describe how you see that income gap in world economics and whether there's something we should be doing about it or what we can be doing about it? Um, I, we had a meeting at the, the OECD where I was. We have a big ministerial meeting every year and we were talking about income inequality in the room. And at one point, the, an Italian economist says, uh, we have to worry about income inequality because it can lead to discontinuities. Everybody sort of nodded along, you know, big words and stuff like that. And then it sort of, you know, light bulbs go off in people's heads. What's a discontinuity? Well, it's riots. It's, you know, overthrowing governments. Uh, it's, you know, people smashing windows. I mean, <laughs> that's what discontinuity is. And I think, you know, income inequality underlies a lot of the frustrations in the world right now. Um, certainly, it was a contributing factor in the Arab Spring. Um, I see it, I see Occupy Wall Street and the Tea Party really being the same thing. People who think the system's rigged and not fair because of the inequalities that they're seeing. And we've got to deal with it. And we've got to deal with it, I think, not just in political terms, but in economic terms. I think some of the writing now in economics is starting to say income inequality inhibits growth and steps to improve equality promote growth. Now, in some ways that's counterintuitive because you say, well, if you take money away from some people and give it to other people, you know, how can that contribute to better growth? But what it is, is the more money in that very, 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 very top of the income scale, they don't spend it as much. They put it in the bank, they invest it, some of that investment money goes outside the country, wherever. Whereas the more money that goes into median income and below, that money gets spent in the local economy. So it actually drives growth. And so there's a lot more economic uh, literature now on quality growth coming from quality governance. And quality growth, one element, is reducing in inequalities. So I think it's a big factor. I think it's a factor for us. I think it's a factor for a lot of countries around the world. Um, and when you think about middle class revolt, a lot of it is based on inequality. There's all kinds of numbers. But you know, the bottom line is for us in the United States, our distribution of income is the way it was in 1929. We haven't been that unequal since 1929, uh, the year the stock market crashed. And so, you know, we can all argue about what to do about it, but the fact is the people in the middle have not been increasing their incomes, people at the top who have. Um, I guess the, the final comment on this is there's, there's one economist, an Indian guy who's now the, the economist of the World Bank, and in his book he says, Governments should never put out gross economic figures. They should never be judged by how much national income grows. I mean, the, the total wealth in the U.S. economy, you know, uh, Warren Buffett makes another billion dollars, your average income goes up, you know. But I don't think you feel that much better. Um, and he knows that. Not everybody at that level does. What really matters is how do you treat, how does the income go up at the bottom 10, 20%? Pick whatever people you want. Pick the median income. If those people are making more money, everybody's going to do okay. And I think that's where we ought to think. Not just about re redistribution, 
but making sure those people have the tools to get jobs, have the opportunities to start companies, and have the ability to get ahead the way our generation did. Some 150 years ago or so, Immanuel Kant wrote a book about perpetual war and perpetual peace. And he had a formula of a triangle. He said, for peace, you need international trade, you need democrat governments, and you need NGOs. How do you think we're doing compared to what he, his insight that long ago? Well, we've pretty much got it. So this can be peace forever. Um, Unfortunately, 115 years ago was just before 100 years ago. 100 years ago, World War I broke out. And at the time, everybody said, well, you can't go to war. Everybody's got these mixed up interests where they're trading and they're selling to each other and they're in, I don't know, value chains. They're making products together. And everybody's interests are so tied up that if I go to war with you, well, I lose and you lose both right from the start because of international commerce. And so, what happened? Well, they went to war anyway. So I don't think we can be complacent. We see that going on around the world. We're all tied together in value chains. We're all mixed in together on climate change. But you know, I don't think we can be complacent. I think we've got to be out there spending the money and the effort to keep creating peace every day and to helping people along. Um, Tom Friedman has the corollary that no two countries with McDonald's have ever gone to war with each other. I'm not sure it's still true. That was about 10 years ago. But it's not the fact they have McDonald's that keeps them from going to war. You know, maybe it's the, the peaceful development of a society they create that means that they start having McDonald's. But in any case, I don't think there's some magic indicator that says, oh, there's going to be peace now. Thank you for coming, Ambassador. Russia, should we be worried? Yeah, but not, don't freak out. Um, yes, we should be worried. I mean, the, the Russian leadership, they have, uh, well, Putin in particular has empire envy. You know, he misses the Soviet Union, he misses the Tsarist Empire, he misses Russia with a large sphere of influence. You know, Russia has always saved itself by having distant borders by you know, how far Napoleon's army had to go to get to Moscow, and then they were exhausted and froze to death and had to retreat. So I think somewhere deep inside the Russian idea of foreign policy is that you have, the more space you have, the safer you are and the more you can develop. And Putin in particular is, is sort of feels severely wounded by the fall of the Soviet Union, the end of the Soviet sphere of influence. So he has empire envy. He wants to reestablish some kind of broader sphere of influence. He's going to keep pushing on that. But I think he's made you know, a, a, a miscalculation in Ukraine. You know, what he's really done is told everybody, you've got to worry about the Russians. And he's actually limited the Soviet sphere of influence, the Russian sphere of influence. It's really getting hard to remember when to say Soviet and when to say Russia these days. Uh, but you know, okay, I don't think any of us are going to go to war over Crimea. Um, we'll try to help the Ukrainians, you know, preserve eastern Ukraine. And there are a lot of things we can and should be doing to, to help them and to expand what you might call the European platform, you know, to them and others in the neighborhood. But um, in the end, Putin's kind of drawn this line and said this is, you know, this is where our influence is going to end. And so he's really constraining Russia and foregoing influence more broadly in Europe where he could have had it if he'd pursued a different policy. So I think it's a pretty bad miscalculation, plus the, the losses of investment, the losses of some of the trade that's going to happen. And if you look at what's going da down in, in another part of the world that I used to work a lot in, which is Central Asia out there, it's called the stands, you know, the Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan area. Um, 
when I was working on it, everybody thought this was a game, you know, that the, the great game had started again, and the U.S. and Russia were vying for influence in this region. But in the meantime, the Chinese were coming in, and they were moving in goods. They have pipelines now going across Central Asia into China, so that Central Asians now have an opportunity to export their oil and gas to China, and there's going to be more and more of that. There may be a trans-Afghan pipeline so Central Asians can export down to the Indian Ocean. So what's happening is Russia is losing its monopoly on oil and gas in this region. And yet, you know, they think that it's still their hinterland. They think it's still an area where they hold sway. So everywhere I look, and partly as a result of these aggressive belligerent moves by Putin, I see Russia as actually shrinking its sphere of influence instead of it making it bigger. Um, that's a big political calculation. Uh, it doesn't do a whole lot of good for some of the people in Crimea who don't want to be part of Russia. It doesn't do a whole lot of good to some of the people in Ukraine. But I think the best we can do is try to help those who are outside this immediate restricted area and help them develop and have other opportunities besides Russia. The, uh, the third ICC report on the um, need for immediate and uh, drastic action to um, reduce carbon emissions and try and save what we see as our, the world we have now, what do you see as the chances of all of us getting together and doing it? What was the response on carbon tax? was <laughs> no way. Um, I, I don't have a whole lot of hope for international negotiations on climate change. I, I wish there was uh, more of a chance and better examples. At the same time, I think there's a little bit of hope in the fact that more and more countries are taking it seriously for themselves. As I said, the Chinese are starting to do that. The Indians not there yet, but actually have been a little more serious in the past few years than previously. Um, I think Americans are taking it more seriously. So, you know, if we're lucky, each country is going to have to face up to this as its own problem and deal with it in its own way and hopefully more and more successfully. Um, we tried working with the G20, the OECD that I was working at, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development tried to get countries to eliminate their subsidies for oil. Subsidies for hydrocarbons uh, drain the budget, first of all, and second of all, help pollute the environment. And, and a lot of countries have done it, and they've done it incrementally, little by little. The, in the Indians sort of two or three years ago decided to increase the cost of diesel fuel, and they did it sort of halfway, and then they put in a ratcheting up effect so that every couple months it goes up by a couple pennies couple of rupees and to get to world prices. So there are people doing things like that around the world. The Indonesians told me they couldn't get a bill through their parliament. Um, so what they did is they restricted zoning for gas stations inside the city. So you could only get a zoning permit for something big enough to refuel a motorcycle. So more and more people, instead of driving their cars, were driving motorcycles, which are more fuel efficient. So the things like that that people are starting to do, even in the countries that are having the most difficulty facing the problem, and I think that may end up being a better route to go. That means uh, our, you know, our, our energy analysts, our economic analysts, our NGOs um, ought to be working really hard on international cooperation, helping each country figure out what it is they can do to deal with this as their own problem, not just a global problem. This may end up being the last question, so Better make, be it, a, good make one, it a then, tough then. one. Just touching on China again, um, what are they doing to change the model? I guess they probably burn more coal, coal than any nation in the world. What are they doing to change that model? And is there any examples there that are relevant to the U.S.? Um, I, I mean, I guess. You know, they have been trying to increase energy efficiency in the enterprises. I don't think they've necessarily changed the fuel as much as the, the efficiency of the machinery and the 
and the work process. Uh, so that's being looked at in a lot of places. Um, they've done some, I think, with building materials. Uh, but I'd probably have to ask Google before I gave you a more definitive answer. Uh, all right, we've got a chance for one more, and I'll give you a quick question and a quick answer. Yeah, I <clears throat> appreciate your being here very much. Um, what is your take on, on the ability of uh, societies to affect uh, ideologies? Um, thinking about jihadists, uh, the ideologues in the Middle East who, you know, we've been singularly unsuccessful in having any impact on that. How do you see that play out? I think, you know, if, if we can deliver decent government and government services through a democratic model, that a lot of those things will fade. Um, I don't think you can talk people out of ideology. You got to show them another way that works. And if they get jobs, if they get opportunities, there'll be less and less of the angry young men. And I think that's all we have time for. So I want to thank everybody for having us. That was Ambassador Richard Boucher speaking about emerging markets in this Juno World Affairs Council presentation. It was produced in collaboration with 360 North and recorded April 23, 2014 at 360 in Juneau.